welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. So Reed, two weeks ago, we heard from Lieutenant Colonel Matt Hoyt. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from him again, this time on the topic of being a flight doc or flight surgeon. But before we get into any of that, once again, please do not send us or Matt your medical questions. We're not going to answer those. He's not in a position to answer your specific medical question. Please, if you have any questions about your medical condition, a waiver you're pursuing, or anything that's related to medical standards for you as an individual, go see your own doctor, go to the clinic, go talk to the people that are responsible for you. Exactly. Again, Matt's super happy to reach out and get in touch and discuss aspects of this career field, how to join, how to, what a day in the life is like, what career progression looks like, maybe even options on the outside. But exactly, Colin, we're not going to answer medical questions. Don't even try. So all that said, this is a really exciting career field that we're going to talk about today, being oh, yeah. a flight surgeon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, can you think of a better blend of just awesome things that you get to do, helping people in, on the medical side, and you get to go fly? Like, that's your job? Yeah, he wears pajamas to work every day, just <laughs> like, you know, all these other flyers. And yet, and as we'll discover, he is making operationally significant decisions. Mm -hmm. He is influencing ops. As a medical professional. Yeah. So I think if you want to be in the Air Force and you want to be a medical professional, I think this is the perfect blend of both. Yeah. So without further ado, Reed, let's turn it over to your interview with Lieutenant Colonel Matt Hoyt. As promised, I'm joined today by Lieutenant Colonel Matt Shakespeare Hoyt. Sir, thanks for joining us again. Hey, thanks for having me back. Yeah. So last time we talked about the Healthcare Professional Scholarship Program and how you essentially got in and how that program helps pay for med school and recruits a lot of professionals into the military. Today, we're going to talk about a really interesting career field that is somewhat unique. I know that this exists somewhat on the outside, but I feel like most of it is inside the military. And that is flight surgeon. So let's put a pin in that though. Let's learn more about Lieutenant Colonel Hoyt. You know, what's your journey? How did you get to where you are? Why are you in the Air Force? You know, let's give a little background on, you know, where are you from, where you went to school, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely, thank you. So my grandfather served in the Army, 27 years in the Army, retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. And as a junior in high school, I I wanted to go into the military in some way. I knew I wanted to be a physician. I knew I wanted to go to med school. And I had seen how my grandparents had been positively benefited by his service in the military. And so I sat down with my grandpa and I said, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. First thing he said was, don't go army. He said, if you're ever thinking about having a family, you wanna to go to the Air Force. And I said, okay. And then he gave me a whole bunch of great reasons why, and I loved every one of them, but that was the beginning. So I applied for ROTC because that's the main option for a high school kid that's looking about military was I wanted to go to school, so I didn't want to enlist. So I applied for ROTC. I actually applied through the Navy and through the Air Force at first, but the Navy was much more focused on the nurse corps and corpsmen and stuff. And the Air Force was like, heck yeah, let's do this. So I actually got an Air Force ROTC scholarship right out of high school, went to the University of Utah, started my first year of ROTC on scholarship, which was cool. They paid for my tuition books and fees in undergrad. And my understanding of the way the ROTC scholarships work, if you go from undergrad into medical school, you basically automatically transition from ROTC into that HPSP program, which without even having to do another application or anything, it's just automatic, which was really awesome. So that was my plan. I was like, okay, I'm going to do my four years of undergrad, go straight into four years of med school, and it's a year for your commitment. 
just like that. So oh, eight years, you know, I was planning on staying 20 years no matter what. And so who cares what your commitment is? Eight years is eight years. You get over with that and then you still have 12 years anyway. Yeah. So did my first year of undergrad, served a two-year LDS mission, came back, jumped right back into ROTC, second year, picked it right back up. And I was prepping for field training. And in order to go to field training, you have to have a new physical for field training. And during that physical, as they're going through my history and stuff, they're like, any of this, any of this, any of this. And then they came to, I had had kidney stones while I was in the Philippines. And so they're like, any history of kidney stones? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, what? And so they were like, that's a disqualifying thing. And I thought he was saying disqualifying for field training. And I was going to have to go get seen by somebody and do a waiver and all this, whatever. Right. So finished up the physical back to an ROTC. And I mean, I was so actively involved in ROTC. I was in Honor Guard. I was in Arnold Air Society. I flew with Civil Air Patrol. I did a little bit of everything I possibly could. So anyway, about February-ish or March-ish, my attachment commander calls me into his office and tells me that I'm being medically disqualified out of ROTC. I was like, what does that mean? He's like, well, you're going to lose your scholarship and this after the semester's over, you're done, you know, and there's nothing we can do. And I was like, anyway, so... We applied for an exception to policy because the waiver was denied. The exception policy was denied. And at the end of that semester, it was like, hey, thanks for hanging out with us for two years. But there you go. So what year was that? That was in 1999. Okay. Yeah. So when you're an ROTC cadet, there's so many pathways that you've got ahead of you that you don't know where you're going. And even though I was like, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to med school, I'm doing all this stuff. None of those things are guaranteed as an ROTC cadet. You apply for things, but I found out, you know, throughout the years that I may have commissioned as a second lieutenant after ROTC and been a logistics officer for a couple of years and then been given the opportunity to go to med school. So nothing was guaranteed, even though in my brain it was guaranteed. So anyway. But but still to tear that rug out from under the plan, you know. Completely changed my outlook on what the next 20 years of my life was going to be. Yeah. Because I was convinced I'm going to go to med school right after this and then be in the Air Force for 20 years and whatever, right? So now all of a sudden the Air Force is off the table. And so I'm, okay, now I got to figure out paying for undergrad, got that taken care of. You know, I'm still going to school. I'm still charging ahead to be a doctor. And In the meantime, got married and had our first daughter the year I graduated in 2002. So finished undergrad, applied for med school, got accepted med school. Graduated in 2002? Graduated in 2002. So 9-11 has happened at this point. Yep. So interesting. Did that push you farther away from service or draw you closer to it? So honestly, the conversations I had with my wife were, what options do we have to not get buried by debt by going to med school. Yeah, okay. Because we were going to go to med school and we were going to do this and we were going to figure it out. Okay. But to be honest with you, the military option was, it had been taken off the table. So it, that was it not wasn't even, even there in your mind. Mm-mm. Yeah. No, and so I had started medical school on campus and you know, there's a handful of the second year med students that are on campus with us that were in one of the service programs for HPSP. And one of the days they had all three services had recruiters on campus. They had a little table out in the main walk area. And I was walking from one building to another building and saw him and stopped and said, hey, because you can't just walk by people and ignore them. So I just said, hi, how you guys doing? You know, I knew who they were. I knew what they were out there for. But because I said hi, instantly they're all like, oh my gosh, you're somebody who's interested, right? So they all asked, are you interested in joining the military? And I said, ah, I've already been medically disqualified. I can't. And they were like, what for? And I said, oh, I had kidney stones. And they're like, well, if we could get you a scholarship, would you be interested? And I was like, "Uh, yes. (laughs) That was the first moment that now the military was a possibility again. So I went home and I talked to my wife. I was like, hey, I might be able to get a, a military scholarship and be able to get back on that path. She's like, what? I was like, yeah, do you want to do that? And she's like, yeah. So... The next day, all three services came back and they're like, yeah, we got a scholarship for you. And I was like, holy cow. Wow. I mean, just that fast. It was that fast. I mean, I hadn't done any pay. I hadn't filled anything out. They just basically looked, is this person qualified from medical standpoint, from whatever? Can we even begin the process? Okay. And they all came back and said, yes. So obviously it was Air Force all the way. So I said, thank you much, very much to the Navy and the Army guy. 
told the Air Force recruiter, I was like, hey, let's do this. And so we filled out the paperwork, submitted everything. There was a local, I think it was a nurse that actually interviewed me. She came to the campus and during like a lunch break, we sat down in some crummy little cafe and had an interview and they formally offered me the scholarship and all that. And this was right around Christmas time. During that Christmas break, I was up visiting family and that's when I had my grandpa administer the oath of commissioning. And I formally took that oath and signed the paperwork and sent it off. And anyway, that's how I got into the HPSB program as a med student. So during med school, did OTS between my first and second year because I wasn't in HPSP before I started med school, so I didn't do it before. And that was the last kind of break that we really had. And then third and fourth year, I did an internal medicine rotation, then I did a family medicine rotation, both at Eglin Air Force Base, because that's where I was targeting to apply for my residency program. Okay. And that's kind of how a lot of the HPSP students do it. Your 45 days of reserve time that you actually go active duty, you just do one of your rotations each year at an active duty base. And that's the best time because you actually get paid your active duty base pay. You actually get BAH for a month. So you you start to see what some of the benefits are. Whereas the other students in med school, they just go do residency. You're actually getting paid like a career professional. Uh, During that month. During that month. During that one month, yes. So instead of it all being expenses, you actually get a little something coming in. And exposure to what you're going to be doing here in a couple years anyway. Absolutely. So being there at Eglin Air Force Base was awesome because you get an introduction to what the hospital looks like. You get an introduction to the medical electronic systems that they use, which um, your electronic health record they had just started using what I think everybody is currently familiar with, which is Alta. And so I was there essentially right when that was introduced and started for the current residents. And man, talk about a nightmare for them. They were not very happy to transition from dictation to now we have to do everything in this system that's brand new and not very great. So anyway, I did those rotations Loved it. It was a great experience. Knew that, yep, this is where I want to go. While I was there, interviewed for my residency. And then middle of your fourth year, you get accepted to whatever your residency is going to be. There's a GME match, which is your graduate medical education match. And that's, you know, which residency are you getting accepted for? All my classmates were finding out where they were going, both civilian and military and whatnot. Yeah. And then graduated med school, recommissioned as a captain on the day of graduation. And then... That was May 17th, June 1st. They wanted us on the base. That's like, here's your sign-in date. Report no later, June 1st. So, And did you get sent to Eglin? Was that your first duty yep, station? that was my first duty station. So I got accepted to the family medicine program there at Eglin. So packed up my family. Now it was uh, me, my wife, and three kids and drove across country and arrived at Eglin, checked in on June 1st, 2006, and started our in-processing and the beginning of residency. So three-year residency in family medicine, finished that, graduated from that residency program, and then went to my first duty station at Hill Air Force Base, Utah, as a family practice doc. I was there for four years and did two deployments during that four-year tour. From there, my commitment was only a three-year commitment because I had a three-year scholarship, basically. So I only owed three years. So right about the time that I had about six months to a year left, and we were trying to make the decision about what we were going to do, you know, stay in or versus get out. And the deployments were awesome. Great experiences. Where did you deploy? I deployed the first time to Kuwait, was there for seven months. And then the second time I started in Kuwait, but then was transitioned down to Aldafra, which is in the UAE. So again, great deployments, great experiences. Being separated from family was the only thing that I didn't like about it. Everything else was just an awesome experience. You are, for the first time, a part of the Air Force. Because as a family practice doc, you see people, you wear a uniform, you see people in clinics, sometimes it's active duty, sometimes it's dependents or retirees, but you're so disconnected from the Air Force mission that you really don't feel like you're part of the Air Force. And that was kind of frustrating for me because I'm like, you know, the only reason I feel like I'm in the military is because I'm wearing a uniform, but there's nothing else. I know nothing else about what's going on. I'm not impacting anything that I could see with regards to the mission. The truth is I was, I just didn't know it. Yeah. So yeah, the deployments were a great experience. And that was the first time that flight medicine was introduced to me in a real way. Like I knew about flight medicine. I had 
had some flight surgeons come and talk to us during our OTC and had a little bit of an introduction to it as a family practice doc in residency. But I really didn't truly understand what they did. I didn't understand what their job was and what their role was. So seeing that from a deployed standpoint, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. So I tried to, while I was stationed at Hill, tried to go to the aerospace medicine primary course to begin the process of becoming a flight doc. And I had a squadron commander that just was not the coolest person on the planet. Anyway, he refused. He's like, I'm not wasting my money on you. And I was like, the Air Force needs flight surgeons. They are begging for people to transition to flight medicine. And you're saying no, because I'm not worth the cost. So Anyway, I already knew what my next duty station was going to be. I had already been penciled in for a follow-on to Italy. And so I was like, I'm not going to get anywhere with this squadron commander. So I just finished up my time at Hill, transitioned on to my next duty station in Italy, where I was still a family practice doc, but I was in the PRP clinic, so personnel reliability program. That clinic was separate from the rest of the med group. We were actually in a separate building on the flight line with flight medicine and our job was 100% operational, mission-oriented, very, very hands-on with the line side, the patients that were on PRP status. Real quick, some of our audience may not know what PRP is. Sure. Could you just like two sentences on what PRP is? Absolutely. So the Personnel Reliability Program, it's a program for anybody that has anything to do with nuclear weapons. So whether they're maintaining them, the electronic systems, whether they're guarding them as security forces, where they're actually in a bunker, you know, finger on the button, waiting for that code to come through that says, push this, button, whatever. Like anybody that does anything with the nuclear weapons program is on that PRP program. So we take care of them because if somebody screws up in the nuclear world, that's a really, really, really bad day. Yeah, the consequences of mistakes. And yeah. as a result, there are subsequent I don't there's, know if there are additional medical standards. Maybe there just are. Like, are there additional? Yeah, okay, there's so. additional standards and the scrutiny, scrutiny that everybody's is yeah. under is just like intense. Yeah. So every medication they take, every concern or condition that they may have gets monitored. And there's very specific guidelines on who can perform PRP duties, on when they can be on status, when they need to be off status. And so you make a lot of medical recommendations. You're talking to commanders and the line constantly. This is starting to like introduce you again to Absolutely. that side of the Air Force. Had I not been in the PRP program, I probably would have switched over to flight medicine a lot earlier. Okay, because you were kind of getting that op side that yeah, you were missing yeah. and kind of noticing that you were interested in anyway. Yeah, and so, I mean, like, my time there was awesome. I loved it. I was doing a job that most people hate being involved in PRP because it is under so much scrutiny and there is so much administrivia associated with that program. But I loved it because I had the staffing I needed to do quality work because that's what they demanded. And because they demanded high quality, because everybody at the higher levels knew that their jobs were on the line if anything got messed up. And not only their jobs, but, you know, huge catastrophic things could happen. But usually staffing and manning is a big headache uh, yeah, for any clinic. Yeah, Air Force. <laughs> and Air Force-wide, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But PRP is not. Okay. So I loved being in PRP because I could do the job I was being asked to do, and they gave me the people to be able to do it. So that was awesome. And I was operational. I was hands-on with the line and just felt like I was a part of the Air Force, 100%. So Fast forward from Italy. Yep. We met in Montgomery. Yep. In the last episode, we talked about how, you know, we were both stationed there. You were there working as a flight doc. As a flight doc. Yes. Yeah. That's because I remember walking into the clinic and seeing you in a flight suit. Yep. And being like, huh, I thought he was a doctor. Yeah. Which we'll talk about, right? Because yeah. that kind of threw me for a little bit. Wings and everything. Yep. I mean, yeah. So yep. that's where we met and our families got to know each other. And we had just come from Hawaii. Mm hmm. And after your assignment in Montgomery, I went to Fort Meade in Maryland yep. and you guys went to Hawaii. Yep. So I finally got to do the aerospace medicine primary while I was in Italy. So I came over here to Ohio for six weeks, went through the courses, AMP 101, 201, and 202, got my wings. And the reason I did that was because my intention was after I leave Italy, my next duty station, I'm going to be a flight doc. I'm not going back to straight family medicine. Yeah. I knew that's what I wanted to do. So at Maxwell, that was my first duty station as a flight surgeon. And so you have your book learning and then you have your on-the-job training. So your upgrade training, which 
everybody should be fairly familiar with once they get in the military. Everybody does upgrade training. Yeah. You get your book learning and then you get your upgrade training while learning your job. So I did that there at Maxwell and the two and a half years there learned, you know, what it was like to be a flight doc in the Air Force and what I needed to do. In Hawaii, I was actually there as the chief of aerospace medicine or the head flight doc for the med group, which put me on the executive staff of the med group. So I was basically with the squadron commanders, the med group commander and the chief and everybody that was in that small group of leadership loved it. You get to mentor all the physicians in the med group. You get to be involved in the conversations about the med group and how they're going to interact with the line and what they do to take care of the mission. Not to mention, there's kind of a lot of airplanes and pilots oh, yeah. out there at Hickam. Oh, Got yeah. Lots going on. So, I mean, like, besides taking care of folks in the clinic, as the chief of aerospace medicine, I was the senior authority on medical standards for all things flying. Not only do you have your regular flying squadrons, you've also got PACAF, which is the MATCHCOM there. And then you also have PACOM on the island, which is your COCOM for the region. And so you're dealing with, you know, your lieutenants and your captains and your majors that are the flyers and your enlisted flyers as well, your load masters and whatnot. But you're also dealing with a lot of the senior leadership from the squadron commanders of the flying squadrons to the wing commander, to the PACAF commander, to the PACOM commander. So General Brown, uh, who's our chief of staff, he was Com PACAF at the time. So I saw him as a patient, like, come to see me for his, you know, whatever he needed. And when you have generals in the med group, The medical commander wants to know who's in my med group. So that kind of stuff is always very high vis and whatever. So it's really cool because you get involved in those conversations about mission impact. You get involved in the conversations about regional mission impact, not just like what's impacting us here at the clinic or at the med group. It's much more far reaching, which is really neat to actually feel a part of the big mission of the Air Force all the way around. So that was one of the big pushers for it and definitely has played out that way. And after Hickam, you're actually here in Wright Pat. So we yep. met up again, as is fate. It's awesome. I get to hang out with the Hoyts again. But you're now stationed here. You're going to an additional course to get even more qualified, as if you already weren't. <laughs> you're getting more qualified. So what are you doing here now? So I'm here as a resident of aerospace medicine. So this is a unique program, not unique to the Air Force, because the Navy and the Army have residencies of aerospace medicine as well. They call them RAMs. So the residency of aerospace medicine is very specific to get into much more detail about medical standards, about the hows and whys of medical standards. So you're not just, here's the standard, learn it. It's, here's why there's this standard. Here's the aeromedical risk associated with this problem or this disease that leads to us having these guidelines. And this is why this requires a waiver. And we actually are rewriting some of these waivers every year. Like that's part of the residency. The other part of it is, is a master's of public health to learn more about emergency preparedness, emergency management, disaster preparedness, and kind of that big response mechanism, which as a senior flight surgeon, you're also the public health emergency officer for the base. So when COVID hit, there I am at Hickam and I'm talking with the wing commander, the joint base commander, the DHA commander, which is over all the services, medical, and uh, all the sister service counterparts about the COVID response for the island. And, you know, that's a role that you are taking on with more or less a week and a half of training and some CBTs, you know, some computer-based trainings. So coming here and doing this residency, I actually will have a chance to get two years of learning a lot more information and detail about the why behind all of these things, which will hopefully translate into me being more effective as decision-making and educating and counseling and advising the line side of the Air Force in whatever, you know, my next duty is. But yeah, so residency of aerospace medicine from here, maybe I'll be going back to a larger med center as the chief of aerospace medicine. I might be a MAGCOM chief of aerospace medicine. There's lots of other kind of positions, but all of them are geared towards, you know, making me as an Air Force officer, a more effective officer, a more effective leader, and much more useful asset to making that mission happen. Awesome. I think that's a really good place for us to transition to what is 
a flight surgeon. Absolutely. Because, you know, everybody in the audience has gone to a medical professional of some kind for something. So we have a general sense of what doctors and nurses and dentists, and we have a sense of what they do. Yep. But a flight surgeon's a different thing. It's a different beast. And I think that it's got some interesting aspects. So what is it that a flight surgeon does that just a general practitioner doesn't do? And why do they have this field in the Air Force? Absolutely. So your flight surgeon is your operational medical connection. So when you're thinking about the Air Force mission in general, if you don't have a flight surgeon involved in the process, like as a family practice doc, I really didn't know much about the medical standards other than I knew they existed. And I knew that if I had a question about whether somebody was qualified or disqualified for continuing in service, I'd go talk to my flight surgeon and they knew the answer. The reason they know the answer is because they're intentionally put into that position to be the medical standards experts for the med group. And this isn't just for flyers though. This no, is for this like is for everybody. everybody. So like, random retention. admin, enlisted troop, yep. intel officer, public affairs official, anybody who's in the United States Air Force yep. has to meet medical standards. Yep. And it's the flight surgeon who's making that call when or if something develops. Yep. So you have your accession standards to join the Air Force. Are you fit to be a member of the Air Force? And then you have your retention standards. So that's really where the flight surgeons, you know, earn their pay is in understanding and applying medical standards for retention. And then for the flyers, anybody that holds a 2992, which is your authorization to fly as air crew, they fall under more stringent standards that are also outlined in the medical standards directory, which lists for retention, plus all your different flying classes, flying class one, two, three, ground-based operators, special warfare operators, all that different stuff. So those medical standards are for you you might be able to be retained in the Air Force, but maybe you're not qualified to do your flying duty. And then we would write the waivers and submit those things. And that pulls up the waiver guide, which is a whole other huge document that further outlines the requirements for meeting standards. But standards, that's the big piece. Okay. Flight surgeons are your standards experts. Okay, nice. So I'm just going to say this right now. Anybody across the audience who's like salivating that they can reach out to this guy and ask him questions directly, we're not going to do that. We are happy to hear your questions, but we're not going to answer any medical questions. Please go talk to your local flight yes. surgeon. Okay, yes. good. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> Matt's a great guy. He'll reach out and talk to you and you can contact him by reaching out to us. But uh, we are not going to answer any medical questions absolutely, because that's not the right way to do it. Now, if you just want to talk to Matt sometime, great guy. He'll talk to you anytime. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. I, just, I felt like we needed to get that out there. Okay. So that's a big deal. I mean, I yeah. feel like you hold a position of real power and authority. And, you know, a number of episodes back, you know, I kind of made this big stand that unless you're you know, a leader of airmen in the combat role. You don't need to be an officer. And I've already eaten crow on that statement. And I'm going to eat some more here. This is, to me, a very clear place where you need to be making decisions that are going to have operational impacts. Absolutely. I mean, pulling the wings from a pilot, that's no small thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And luckily, I'm not doing that by myself. So... We are the person on the base that is your first point of contact and your leadership's first point of contact. If there's a question, if there's a concern, anything when it comes to somebody's ability to fly, somebody's fitness for duty and ability to be retained in the Air Force. And, you know, there's so many circumstances where people get hurt, people get injured, people get ill. And when you have a medical condition, the question is always like, well, how's this going to impact me? Are you deployable? Are you able to meet fitness standards? Are you able to continue to do your job? Some people get illnesses and injuries that just make it that they can't do the job that they're currently doing. We are there to help them navigate the retraining process. Are they even eligible to retrain into a different career field? And then how do you go about doing all that? And then for deployments, are you clear for deployment? That all goes through a flight surgeon in the pre-deployment process. And then you know, you might need a deployment waiver. So all of these things where anybody who wants to do a mission in the Air Force, whether it's deployed or in garrison, that's going to get through a flight surgeon one way or another. Yeah. So especially from the flying side, mm -hmm. that's got to be hard to know what they go through. And that's something else I want to bring up. You're a rated officer. 
Is that correct? Like you have wings and you wear a flight suit and you get flight pay. Yes. So I'm an air crew. You're air crew. rated air crew. I am okay. on aeronautical orders. Okay. I fly with the air crew. And the whole reason I fly with the air crew is so that when they come into my office and they are describing, hey, doc, I've got this going on. I know the airframe they're in. I know the vibration, the noise, the pressure changes, all the different physiologically impacting stuff that they're exposed to. Now I can talk their language to them to help them, you know, are you wearing your proper ear protection? Are you doing, you know, proper hydration, proper this, proper that, you know, your fitness requirements to be able to execute the mission. And if they're not, I get to be the one to talk to them and to their leadership directly about, hey, here's why Johnny so-and-so shouldn't be on this mission, this particular mission. And we're going to get him to the point where he can be on the next one. You know, like that's the role of that flight surgeon is to make those hard calls, to have those hard conversations because no flyer wants to go down. And this is why flyers don't like coming into the med group is because the number one fear of a flyer is you're going to put me down on status and I'm not going to be able to fly. Even when I was going through OTS, we had guys who were afraid of reporting a cold because they yeah. were terrified you're gonna, that yeah. They, yeah, they weren't going to allow to get their wings and go to pilot training. Oh, yeah. And everybody that goes through pilot training is a type A personality. So you take all the different things that being a member of the military has and then take that top 10% of crazy type A driven people. And that's typically who I'm working with. And it's hard to tell one of those guys no. And a lot of times we're trying to find a way to keep them in the seat. Like what can we do to keep you flying, but yet maintain safety and yeah. maintain standards. And you know, there's a lot of medical reasons that people get brought down. And if all you do is look at, oh, you've got sleep apnea. Yep, I got a DNIF you. I got to take you off status. Well, not necessarily. Yeah, DNIF is duties not including flying. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, just so, <laughs> some people might know. Yeah. Yeah. You get so used to the acronyms in the yep. Air Force, yeah, you start know, throwing you, stuff yep, out and yep. you forget, oh, wait, that's not something that everybody knows. Yeah. Yeah. So bringing them down from flying status is a big deal because they might be one of one. The yeah. only guy that can do this job and you just pulled them off, that means their entire crew is now grounded because if they don't have that guy, they can't do the mission. There's no reason for them to be there. And that happened to me at Maxwell, actually. We had a gentleman that was, uh, he operated the equipment for surveillance equipment in a plane and he was the only guy that operated the equipment. So he wasn't the pilot. He was whatever that sensor operator, whatever they called it. He operated the surveillance equipment but without him, there was no reason for that plane to be flying around Yeah, because they're there to survey. And if they can't surveil the ground because that guy's out, they can't do their job. So while we were working through his waiver as quickly as we possibly could, because part of the problem is you have to get whatever the medical condition is corrected. Yeah, if it's sure. correctable. Obviously, you have to care for the patient as yeah. well. So you're doing your patient care, which is, hey, that's what everybody that's a physician in the Air Force does is take care of patients, take care of the medical problem. But on top of that, you're taking care of the mission and ensuring safety of mission and safety of flight, safety for the rest of the air crew. And for this gentleman, you know, it was like a three month period. And I think every other week I was talking to the aircraft commander plus his commander. And they were like, hey, are we going to be able to fly this mission on this date? And I was like, he's not going to be approved for a waiver until we get to this point. And I'm not the one that's the approval authority. Thank goodness. I write the waiver. I submit the waiver. And then it goes up to usually a match comm level. And that's where the approval authorities are. So maybe that'll be my future job, but not yeah. right now. So okay. anyway, so I've got to try and meet the mission, but also take care of the member. It's kind of a unique position to be in because sometimes doing the right thing for the member is to pull them from a mission. And that's hard for the member to accept. It's hard for the unit to accept, but sometimes that's the right thing medically and safety wise. So Yeah, I mean... That doesn't sound too different from any combat commander yeah. managing risk, yeah. right? They are trying to achieve mission success, but you can't do that with no risk. Yeah. And so you're balancing the safety of the member, the safety of the rest of the crew, if there is a crew, safety of that asset, mm -hmm. success of the mission. You're trying to balance all of that as you work through this really challenging scenarios. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure none of these people get emotional. I'm sure this isn't oh, no. rolled with it. I'm, yeah, this, this has got to be incredibly challenging. Nobody ever, you know, loses their temper in our offices and gets frustrated about things at all. It's, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. No, that's a daily conversation. And, you know, what's funny is I talked a little bit about being a public health emergency officer as well. When you're talking about um, managing risk, 
that's another aspect of that where you're advising a wing commander about what to shut down on the base and what mission critical things can't shut down and how to keep those mission critical things functioning either by accepting some level of risk when it comes to a pandemic illness on an entire unit scale. So not only are we dealing with individuals, you know, the same kind of thing can be applied to uh, the entire squadron, the entire wing, you know, on a base at times. So, wow. I'm guessing flight docs will also deploy to make similar Absolutely. calls. You know, somebody gets back, they had a headache on their flight or something was off. And they're going to be in that situation as well. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So some flight docs are attached to the med group and they will still deploy, but they usually will deploy in a random flight doc position that's going wherever. Then you also have squadron medical elements or SMEs that are attached to the unit. They're not even owned by the med group, but they're a flight surgeon attached to the unit. So if that unit deploys, that person goes with them. Okay. If they go on a three-week mission, you know, to wherever, usually that flight doc will be going with them, just like as if they were deployed from the med group, but they're that unit's medical asset to take care of the members of that squadron primarily. And then while they're in garrison, they still come and work in the med group and help, you know, pull call and write waivers for other flyers that are on the base, not just their unit, but they're owned by the unit. So those guys go out a lot more. Mm -hmm. for the short ones. Okay. Your typical six-month deployment, any flight doc can get pulled for a six-month deployment anywhere and fill that role. Because again, you're still the medical standards guy in the deployed location. Okay. Now, do you train specifically to like one type of aircraft or is it aircraft big A? Big A. Okay. Yeah. So So, what have you flown in, for example? So I've flown in, the only point he knows one I've flown is the F-16, but I've flown in C-130s, C-17s, RC-26s, HH-60 helicopters. There's a couple other, the nice blue and white ones that they fly the, the, oh, the DV lift. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, You know, C-21, C-27, C-30, just various other shapes and sizes of whatever. Every once in a while I get to put on the harness and go out on the back of the ramp with the load masters and I'll be up in the cockpit with the pilots. You want to get the full aspect of what your air crew are exposed to. And this is from the newest airman to the most senior officer on the plane, understanding what they're experiencing during flight. So getting a chance to get exposed to all those different airframes, all the different jobs on the plane is really cool. We don't do as much with the ground crew or with some of your other support areas, but the SMEs that are in the unit, I mean, they see the entire unit. So they get a much more personal interaction with all different aspects of that unit. As a med group flight doc, you're kind of, you're going out to all the different units and anybody that operates on the flight line or with the flight line. So you get to know not as much depth, but a little bit more breadth. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm thinking, you know, let's put ourselves in the, you know, some random captain out there in the Air Force thinking about being a flight doc. Is it once you're a flight doc, that's what you're going to do? You're going to be a flight surgeon for the rest of your career, or maybe you get in, you do a tour or two, realize this isn't for you. Can you dip in and out? How does that work? Absolutely. So, I mean, the only requirement to be a flight doc is a desire to do it. And then you go to the aerospace medicine primary course. That's where you learn a lot more information about medical standards. You get introduced to medical waivers for flyers. You get introduced to the administrative side, but that's also where you get to fly for the first time. And that was really cool. You know, I got to fly. And that's here at Wright Pat. Yes, yeah, that's, that's done here at Wright Pat. And that program is changing as well. So when I went through, it was three two week courses, and you can split it up or you can do it all in one chunk. I did in one chunk. So I did all six weeks, all in one piece. And then I became a flight doc, but I'm still a board certified family physician. So if I wanted to go back to straight family medicine, Basically, it's just communication with the assignments officers and your consultants. So family medicine has a consultant, flight medicine has a consultant, the surgeons have a consultant, the pediatricians have a consultant, everybody's got a consultant. You basically tell your consultant, here's my intention. Okay. I want to go back to family medicine. Okay. And this does exist outside of the military because there are people who fly that are not military aviators, you know, commercial airline pilots. Yep. You've got, you know search and rescue pilots, you know, uh, you've got sheriff's departments and, you know, random news helicopters and things. So there's got to be, and there are FAA medical standards, correct? So So that's one of the cool things about being a resident of aerospace medicine. I'm actually, I've just finished the aerospace medicine examiner basic course to be an FAA flight surgeon. Basically, I can do FAA physicals 
And once I graduate the residency, I'll have everything I need to do FAA physicals. And they have a, I mean, they've got their own medical process. There's the member fills out their history and whatever, and then they come see an AME. The AME does the physical and then submits their paperwork to the FAA, to the senior flight surgeon, so to speak, the senior AME, and those get either approved, denied, or deferred. So I can approve them right in office, I can deny them right in the office, or I can defer it to the next level up. If there's medical conditions that require a deferral, they're spelled out pretty clearly, but anything that I'm allowed to approve in office, I can do it right there, and I can write them a certificate that allows them to go fly. No, that's great. So yeah. it's not just the military. Sometimes as we go through these interviews, talking to various people and their Air Force specialty codes, there aren't a whole lot of places, if any, where this is a thing. Yeah. You know, especially for some of our enlisted members in the intelligence career field, there's a target here. There aren't a whole lot of places that allow or encourage dropping bombs. Right. And so there's not a lot of places that you can use that skill. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like you know, being in flight medicine sets you up for some alternate options should you decide Absolutely. to pursue a, a career outside the Air Force. Yeah. And already getting that FAA training and certificate, we have a lot of reservists, a lot of guard members that are flyers that when they're on active orders, they come and see me in my clinic. And by understanding the FAA requirements, I can keep them out of trouble with their civilian jobs as well as with the military side. So it's definitely very, very useful to have that introduction and an understanding of those standards because they're similar, but there's some things that the FAA is more rigid on and there's some things that the military is more rigid on because the FAA is willing to accept risk in certain areas that the military is not and vice versa. So a lot of it is flight safety. When you look at aircraft mishaps and aircraft mishap investigation, again, that's another role. As a flight surgeon, you get sent if there's a mishap there will be a flight surgeon on that safety investigation board looking for human factors that went into potentially the cause of the mishap and how do we prevent that for the future. And that you know has nothing to do with retention standards or anything. It's just safety. It's 100% safety and the safety of flight, the safety of the aircraft and making sure that you're decreasing the risk of something like that happening to that crew or to another crew later on down yeah. the road. So we've got that physical asset as mm -hmm. well as that human asset yeah. available to fight the mission. Absolutely. That's awesome. So thanks for really helping us understand this unique role. I think it's a unique thing. Not a lot of people that are outside of the operational Air Force get what that does and what it is. And I've certainly learned a lot. Why don't you give us, you know, one of those pinch me moments where you're like, man, I never would have seen myself doing this amazing thing that being a flight surgeon has brought to you? So there's a couple, but number one was the F-16 flight. I mean, as a physician, you get to fly commercially to go TDY and to go to this. Awesome. You're sitting on a plane with 300 other people. Yeah. When it was just you and one other guy in an airframe where you are basically able to see 360 degrees of sky around you going very fast and doing lots of cool things. That's one of the coolest things, like getting in a plane and actually being able to do that kind of stuff instead of being sitting in an office, typing on a computer or in a clinic, taking care of patients. Like that's one of those things where I was like, this is why I joined the Air Force. Yeah, I joined the Air Force to do cool things and to go cool places. And yeah. that's definitely one of them. Honestly, every single assignment, the different locations you get to go, because every base has a slightly different combination of airframes that are on that base, if anything. And being able to be exposed to those different missions and seeing how each of them plays a role and how your role fits into that overall bigger picture, it's what keeps me going. You know, I've had three or four different opportunities where I could have said, I'm done and separated from the Air Force. And this is not a conversation I have by myself. There's lots of people involved in this conversation, particularly my wife. But one of the things that keeps us staying is we get to go to cool places. We get to do cool things. And sometimes my wife even gets to be involved. So she's had a chance to fly in a couple of C-17 flights that were spouse flights. Like, who gets to do that? Who gets to sit on those kind of things and experience that kind of stuff? So, yeah, yeah, those pinch me moments, you know, just sometimes you're sitting in one of those circumstances and you're just like, I am in a position that not many people get to enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. And it keeps getting you, doesn't it? Yeah, every, well, I mean, every time you think you're just about ready to start thinking about transition, yeah. something happens and you realize that this is a pretty amazing profession that we get to be a part of. So like here with the RAM, I went through the pilot applicant program process 
for the FAA. And we flew with uh, Green County out here in their little archer warriors and pipers. And anyway, it was awesome flying in a piper warrior and you're actually piloting an aircraft. Not many physicians get to say that when they see a patient in clinic, they're like, oh yeah, man, when you're coming in for a landing and you're having to balance all the stuff with the instrumentation, plus keep your eyes around for all the different planes flying around you and talking on the radio and doing all this. And they're like, wait a minute, you've done that? Okay, so you're legit. I can talk to you about this stuff and you understand what I'm saying. I never got to do that as a family practice doc. I mean, I took care of people medically, but I had no clue what all went into each of their different jobs. And as a flight doc, I truly get to do that. And it's like every time I get to see somebody else's job and get an appreciation for what other people are doing, it's awesome. No, that's spectacular. So for the random high school senior who might be listening or you know that enlisted member thinking about transitioning, going to med school, mm-hmm. what is the process? So yeah, they got to go to med school. They got to become an Air Force officer. But let's say you're a family practice doctor. How do you make that transition happen? Like, do you just go to your local flight surgeon and say, sir or ma'am, I would like to have your job? Like, how does that Yeah, so, how does so that that's transition? a great place to start. Like I said, consultants and your assignments officers play a huge role too. Communicate it early. Like, hey, I'm interested in transitioning over to flight medicine from whichever special I am. Because that's the beautiful thing about flight medicine. You can be any kind of a doctor out there. And you can even be a PA or a nurse practitioner. They've got aerospace medicine PAs and nurse practitioners that have a role in that medical standards piece. They don't get to do all the stuff that the surgeons or the physicians do, but still they have some cool stuff. So you can be a pediatrician. You can say, you know, I want to go over to flight medicine. First thing to do is communicate that to your local leadership, communicate that to the flight surgeon there so they can help you with all the other communication pieces. You're going to communicate that to your consultant So they can start being like, okay, so I'm going to take you out of my pool of people for assignments and you're going to be going over to somebody else's pool. You basically, once you do your flying class physical, so I had to do a flying class physical, flying class two, and that gets all taken care of. You go off with a 2992 saying you're medically cleared to participate in this training and ultimately be a flyer. You do the aerospace medicine primary. And then now you're communicating with the flight surgeon consultant for a flight surgeon job at your next duty station, or some people roll right in and take a flight medicine position at the base they're at and basically do a PCA, which is a, you know, instead of a PCS, you're staying, but you're still changing your assignment into flight medicine instead of whatever your previous specialty was. It's a great retention tool for people that want to stay longer in a location. Yeah. But it's also a really cool tool for the GMOs that aren't sure what they want to do for a residency yet, you do an internship, you go into flight medicine, you get to do something operationally really cool while you figure out what do I want to be when I grow up? And then, you know, you apply for your residency down the road two or three or four years later. Awesome. Matt, this has been great. I've really enjoyed this. I think you've taught me a lot about the support side of the Air Force and how They play a critical role. And I know that, right? We've talked about that a lot on this podcast. Everybody plays a critical role, but it's always helpful. It's always beneficial to understand that a little bit more. Yeah. And something we always ask at the end of all of our episodes, and I'm going to pose it to you, is what is an officer? Ooh. Whenever I think of officer, I always think of leader. I think of mentor. I think of someone who is upholding standards like standards of appearance, standards of dress, standards of speech, standards of conduct. It's hard to separate officer from that leader position. And there's plenty of officers that are in a worker bee kind of role. But even in a worker bee role as an officer, you are still leading. Leading by example, you're leading your team, no matter how small that team is. It might be a team of two, but if you're the officer, you're going to be the one that's expected to set the tone. And that's really how I see an officer is no kidding. You are the one that is being seen as the tone setter, the example, the leader of how everybody else is going to kind of base their function and their performance off of you. Yeah. Awesome. And, you know, as you've already described, the number of decisions that a flight surgeon is going to have to make and the impact that those are going to have, it's pretty clear why that needs, in our opinion, to be an officer. Oh, absolutely. And, and historically, I'm sure that's borne fruit. 
Lieutenant Colonel Matt Hoyt, thanks for joining us today. This has been a real treat. I'd love to have you back. Maybe we'll have you on for family medicine. I don't know. Maybe yeah. we'll see how the audience reacts. I had 10 years of family medicine, so okay. I mean, got plenty of experience there. So awesome. Lots of good stuff. And we said this in our HPSB episode, and we mentioned it once earlier. If you want to get in touch with Lieutenant Colonel Hoyt, He's more than happy to answer general questions. We're not going to do any medical standards or anything like that, but just email us at airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com and we'll forward that on to Matt. Great guy. I'm sure he'll be happy to reach out. Anything else before we wrap up? No, just thanks for having me. And again, love talking about the Air Force, love talking about medicine, love talking about being a flight surgeon. It's definitely a really awesome place to be. The best of many worlds. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today, Matt. Absolutely. Once again, Reed, thank you to you. Thank you to Matt. Such a great discussion. Loved hearing about all of his experiences. But first thing, can we go all the way back to the beginning? Oh, yeah. His journey is fascinating. Where he's trying to get in yeah. to the Air Force. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a cadet in ROTC. He's on scholarship. He's super gung-ho, participating in all the things. And then, wham, he's disqualified for kidney stones. Yeah. But that didn't stop him. It, man... <laughs> It just shows me, like, I want to say where there is a will, there is a way, right? That nothing is ever really, truly final. That if you want something, you can go and get it. But we know that that's not exactly true. That there are things that you just are never going to be able to do. I, as a civil engineer, reserve officer, now cross-training into space operations, I'm never going to be the chief of staff of the Air Force. It's just never going to happen. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things that may not be final, that there aren't things that can't go your way. You just need to be aware of the opportunity and prepared to swing when the pitch comes, right? Yeah. Well, and conditions change, right? So agreed, right? The Air Force doesn't owe you anything. <laughs> like plans can change at any moment. But if you think about it, he was attending ROTC prior to 9-11. But then he went to the medical side of things just after 9-11. Right. So the geopolitical circumstances. circumstances had changed. Yep. The recruiting environment was different. The economy was different. And so, man, it depends. We get a lot of, hey, what are my chances emails from you, our audience? And we love those. We really do. We love connecting with you and hearing from you and trying to provide some things to think about or ways you can try and improve your scores or whatnot. We really enjoy fielding those. But one of the biggest things that is always the background and context of my responses when I provide them, especially with people trying to go to OTS, is there is just so much going on in the background, the political situation, the economy, the geopolitics of you know who we may be fighting or not. There's just so much that goes into it that, yeah, it's a really hard thing to say this is an absolute, you know, when it comes to being disqualified or not. It's just a really tough problem. Yeah. So what's the takeaway here? What is it that we want our audience to be thinking about with respect to Matt's individual experience, how he was able to make things work for him? Yeah, he had to go through a time where he thought his dream was dead, but then it was resurrected. And what did he do at that point is exactly what you should be doing at that point. You should be ready. You should look for the opportunity and the people that are going to help you get there. And when that opportunity shows up, you attack it, you get after it with everything that you can. If this is really truly something that you want. Yeah. I think the key is where did he see these medical recruiters at a career fair where he was already taking steps to follow through with his plan B, C, D, E, whatever they were, right? Yeah. It did not happen because he was sitting on his couch thinking, woe is me. I deserve a position in the United States Air Force. That is not how that went. Well, and he, like he went to talk to these people, not because he thought that there was a chance, but just because he's a nice guy. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. We've had other guests on where they've said you have to make your own luck. Mm -hmm. And this is the definition of that for me. He had already qualified himself by getting accepted into medical school and completing his first year. He was already on the list of possibilities, and it was now his time to explore where he's going to do residencies, et cetera. Had he not qualified himself, 
they would not have given him this opportunity. Right. But he had taken action. He had made his own luck. And I think that's the big take home for me. You know, when he had the rug pulled out from him the first time with his desire to be an airman, he's just like, okay, I'll change and continue to work. And he made this happen. Yeah. I think that's the big take home that I would hope our audience would take away. Yeah, for sure. Because that will bring you success in or outside of the Air Force or the military in general. Absolutely. Yep. Be a good person. Continually work on yourself, improve yourself, and the opportunities will come your way. Those opportunities may not be in the Air Force, and that's okay, right? Yeah. But you know what? They may also be in the Air Force, and the Air Force needs good, kind, prepared people to serve as officers. Yeah. And to be medical professionals in flying aircraft. I mean, come on. Let's, let's bring it back to this amazing opportunity, right? So yeah. I think something that we wanted to talk about, Colin, is we understood that there was a pretty stringent fight physical medical requirements for being a flyer and that there were mm -hmm. medical people making those calls. I did not know that those same people were making calls for the rest of the airmen in the Air Force. Right. Yeah, that was a big surprise to me. But as I examined it, and you and I talked about this offline, it makes sense that the people making the judgment calls for medical qualifications for the most strict requirements mm -hmm. would also therefore have all of the baseline requirements pretty down pat. Right. And so I guess that makes sense. But even more so, they have operational experience when it comes to what it means to be in an aircraft. Yeah. Think of how valuable that is when it comes to them being able to connect with their patients and make good decisions. Yeah. And not just operational experience in the aircraft, but operational experience, period. Like they are mission minded. They are focused on what the Air Force is actually trying to do. They care about the mission. And so they're using that lens when they are making not only decisions for the flyers, but for everybody else. For the civil engineering airman that is having a medical issue and they have to make a judgment call, how are they making that call? Through the lens of Air Force operations. Can this airman who is in a role of combat support going to help or hurt the operational mission? That's how they're thinking about these things. In addition to the member receiving the care necessary for them. Right. Matt pointed that out a few times, how... You know, he's making decisions. He was specifically talking about an example there at Maxwell Air Force Base with a specific airman who was, you know, a key role on a crew for a reconnaissance platform. Yeah. He was making operational decisions, and that's what the commanders were coming back at him with. Hey, we need to fly this mission for this reason. But he's also the advocate for the patient. Right. Hey, but this person needs to get well. Mm -hmm. So balancing both of those things led me again to something that I definitely have to eat crow with. That is exactly the kind of decision that officers should be making. Right. The life and limb of the member balanced with risk to the mission, to the asset, to the strategy, to the purpose of existing for a service. I'm not saying our enlisted members can't make that decision, but historically, those types of decisions with that kind of importance have been levied against members of the officer corps. That makes perfect sense. When you yeah. put it in that perspective. Absolutely. And therein is the reason why the officer must be aware of the standards, must be aware of what the mission is, must be aware of their people so that they can balance those judgment calls so that the mission can get done, but also so that the person can be taken care of, whether that means providing them the critical feedback necessary to improve performance, whether that means you are no longer an asset to the Air Force, so we're going to help you to get out and go do something that's more in line with your skill set, your capabilities, and what are the resources necessary to allow the mission to actually get done. The discussion here around a flight doc being responsible for those things is the perfect way to describe what every other officer in the Air Force should be thinking about and how they should approach those decisions. Yeah, couldn't agree more. It was a very interesting discussion to have him walk through some of those examples and the things he was thinking about. It just really opened my eyes for sure. Yeah, it's awesome. And, you know, that actually makes me think about 
another thing that Matt brought up in the interview, specifically about how there are flyers, air crew that hesitate to come and see him because they don't want to get put on DNF. And you explained DNF a little bit in the interview, but let's revisit that again real quick. Duties not including flying, right? What does that mean? So that means exactly what it sounds like, but in translation into reality, that means that you're going to be working in other positions in the squadron. Say maybe you're going to be a scheduler or they're going to move you over to the OSS to work with the Intel flight, or maybe you're going to be the exec. But bottom line, you're going to be doing other things that all have to get done and get done by people flying, but you are not going to get put on the schedule to be on the jet. That's what it means. Right. And a lot of flyers view this as kind of like the death knell of their career, that if they're not in the jet, they're going to lose those perishable skills, how to operate the aircraft. They're not going to be prepared for the operational mission. They're not going to be deployable, those kinds of things. That's what they're afraid of. But here's the thing. They're afraid. And that fear, you know, sorry, I'm thinking in terms of Star Wars quotes now, you know, Yoda, the fear leads to hate, hate leads to suffering you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. That's what I don't want to have happen between flyers and the flight docs. I don't want those people to view each other as the enemy. I don't want anybody who's wearing the same uniform as me to view me as the enemy. I don't want to feel that way about others who are also in the Air Force with me, especially some of these other entities that we so commonly associate with these other parts of the Air Force that have this kind of negative connotation, you know, JA or security forces or the inspectors general. We should not be viewing them as the enemy, right? Exactly. And all too often, I think that does occur. And I think it's an incredibly human reaction. You've wanted to be a pilot your whole life. You've you know, been doing push-ups since you were a fetus, you know, every, you've done everything you can, you have perfect vision, you know, you work out, you're strong, you're healthy, everything's good. But then you go to one medical appointment and they say, for even if it's even for a short period of time, you're now no longer allowed to do the thing that you've been training for your whole life. It's a very human thing. Yeah to react to and be upset about that. And we were facetious on the interview. I said, oh, and I'm sure no one ever gets emotional. And, and, you know, it it is. It's an incredibly emotional experience. So I love how you bring in some of these other components of the Air Force. I think IG and JA are perfect examples of people that you should not get to know in a crisis. Right. (laughs) That is not a time to build a relationship with someone that is not your adversary. Whose side are they on? And I think that's something that you kind of wanted to bring up, right? Whose side is JA on when they tell you you can't do that? Yeah, but let's bring it back to the flight doc because that's the topic of this episode and that's the source of this inspiration. So Matt talks about in the interview how he is focused on the mission, just like we were talking about. He has to make these decisions that enable not only the mission to happen, but to take care of the person, right? He's not making the decision based on whether or not he likes the person he's talking to. He does not say, uh, this one, you know, he cut me off at the main gate. And so I'm going to put him on DNF. That's not what he's thinking. He is not the enemy. Yeah, it's not personal, right? These are mission-centric decisions. And so the same is true for JA and the IG is like, what are they trying to do? They're trying to enable the mission. Yeah, they are in a support role, just like the flight doc is, but they are operationally focused. What are the legal requirements? What is the policy? Are standards being met? That's what they should be asking and answering those questions in such a way that allows for the mission to be accomplished and the individual to be taken care of. Yeah. And I think something that we'd like to throw out to the audience is if you do feel anyone wearing the same uniform as you, that you're in an adversarial construct in some form or fashion, why is that? Why do you feel that way? I think is an important thing to really assess the situation. Am I mad because I don't get to fly the airplane I want to fly? Or are you upset that, which I think is a human reaction, right? That's a human response. Right. Maybe though, you should think about the safety of everybody else on that aircraft or the success of the mission overall 
or the health and safety of the service. You know, so I think it's an important thing when you find yourself in a confrontational situation with somebody who's making operational decisions, why is it that you feel the way you do? I think that's an important thing to ask yourself. Yeah, for sure. The the first question that you should ask in any sort of, you know, in a relationship where there is conflict is what is my role? What is my perspective? How am I contributing to the friction here and how can I make it better? And then the second question is to think of those same things from the perspective of the other person. Are they actually trying to make your life difficult because they don't like you? Or do they care about the mission? Do they care about the health and welfare and safety of the other people involved? Don't place them in an adversarial role. See them as a partner in the direction of trying to get the mission done and taking care of people along the way. Yeah, totally agree. This was a great time for me to sit down with a good friend of mine and learn more about what they do and learn a whole lot more about the Air Force. Got to tell you, I learned a lot sitting down with Matt. Appreciate him coming on. Lieutenant Colonel Matt Shakespeare Hoyt. Awesome guy. If you want to reach out to Matt and ask questions, even big process questions, he's really easy to talk to. He'd be more than happy. Send us an email at airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com. We'd be more than happy to put you in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Matt. Great learning from you. Looking forward to your continued success in the Air Force and further opportunities in the future to learn from you. And thanks to you, Reed, for putting that all together. Thanks to you, audience, for tuning in. And with that, this concludes this week's episode of Commissioned.